The rotator cuff muscles are shoulder muscles that help to add stability to the joint between the humerus and the scapula, the glenohumeral joint. And by the way, it's pronounced cuff, not cup. There are four muscles that make up the rotator cuff, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. These four muscles are sometimes called the sits muscles. Sits is an acronym. If you look at the first letter of each muscle name, you can see they spell the word sits. When you hear the term cuff, you probably think of the end of your shirt sleeves where the fabric is doubled over and wraps around your wrist. Tailors double the fabric over to prevent fraying of the fabric, strengthening it where it receives the most stress. Basically, the cuffs protect the fabric from damage. Like the cuffs of our shirt sleeves, our rotator cuff muscles will wrap around our glenohumeral joints and function to protect and strengthen them. Shirt sleeve cuffs are often loose when they wrap around your wrist, but if you were to wrap something tight around your wrist, it would offer more support. The rotator cuff muscles will contract and tighten around the glenohumeral joint to stabilize it. In doing so, the head of the humerus gets set into the glenoid cavity, allowing for proper movement at the joint. Before other muscles contract to move the arm at the shoulder, the rotator cuff muscles will be recruited to set the head first. To understand this, think of the head as being positioned slightly inferior to the cavity when all the muscles are relaxed. If the humerus were to rotate from this position, the chances the glenoid labrum would become damaged would increase. If the head is set into the cavity before humeral rotation is initiated, the joint surfaces would be properly aligned for smooth and unimpeded movement. Collectively, the rotator cuff muscles will work together to stabilize the shoulder. However, each muscle can function independently to move the arm at the shoulder. In this video, we'll look at each muscle individually to see their unique characteristics and functions. If they're weak, you may notice a sense of uneasiness when you do heavy upper body exercises like bench press or overhead press. This uneasy feeling is due to shoulder instability. Strengthening these muscles will give you a noticeable improvement in your stability and confidence when you do these exercises. Remember, the weakest link in a chain is where it breaks. And more often than not, the rotator cuff is where the weakest link is for most people when they try to lift heavy. Weak rotator cuff muscles may be preventing you from making gains in your heavy exercises, like bench press for example. Make sure you stay tuned until the end of the video and I'll give you some rotator cuff muscle strengthening tips. The first of the four rotator cuff muscles we'll look at is the supraspinatus. The supraspinatus is the most commonly injured muscle of the rotator cuff. This is especially true if you internally rotate and abduct the humerus too high, like when one performs upright rows, for example, or like when you lift a heavy suitcase out of a trunk. The supraspinatus is located on the top of the shoulder, deep to the trapezius. It attaches to the scapula and the humerus. More specifically, it originates from the supraspinous fossa, which is located superior to the spine of the scapula hence the name. It then passes under the coracoacromial arch, which is designed to protect it. However, it also makes the supraspinatus vulnerable to impingement. The supraspinatus then inserts onto the greater tubercle of the humerus. It acts to abduct or abduct the arm at the shoulder. The supraspinatus is considered to be the initiator of shoulder abduction in that it's responsible for the first 10 degrees of abduction before the middle fibers of the deltoid are recruited by the nervous system to help out. Since it's one of the rotator cuff muscles, it'll also function to stabilize the shoulder by helping to set the head of the humerus into the glenoid cavity. It's innervated by the suprascapular nerve, and it gets its blood supply from the suprascapular artery. The tendon is perfused with blood from two sides the suprascapular artery proximally, and the posterior humeral circumflex artery distally. This leaves this middle area between these two arteries the last part to get blood and nutrients. And guess where this less perfused area is located? Directly under the coracoacromial arch. Now one can say that the arch protects this vulnerable area of the tendon. However, if you fully abduct your arm at the shoulder and add some internal rotation, the vulnerable area of the supraspinatus tendon could get injured. Also, because of the blood supply being what it is, it means injuries to the supraspinatus tendon take much longer to heal than other body parts. The next rotator cuff muscle is the infraspinatus. 
It's located on the back of the shoulder and peeks out from underneath the traps, posterior deltoid, and lats. It attaches to the scapula in the humerus. Specifically, it originates from the infraspinous fossa, which is inferior to the spine of the scapula, passes behind the humerus, and inserts onto the greater tubercle of the humerus, just below where the supraspinatus inserts. The infraspinatus acts to externally rotate the arm at the shoulder. Interesting thing about the function of the infraspinatus is that it's the main muscle responsible for slowing a speeding arm, like when someone throws a ball. The muscle will contract eccentrically, lengthening as it contracts, as it slows the speeding arm. Eccentric contractions cause more damage to the muscle, because of myosin heads being forcefully detached from actin filaments. This is why bodybuilders will accentuate the eccentric part of their exercises while training. More damage means more muscle growth. The body will adapt by promoting muscle growth to avoid damage in the future. Often throwing athletes, or athletes that move their arms in a throwing type motion, like baseball players, quarterbacks, even volleyball players, will have tight and tender infraspinatus muscles. Good to know if you're going into a profession that treats athletes. Now since it's one of the rotator cuff muscles, it's also going to function to stabilize the shoulder by helping to set the head of the humerus into the glenoid cavity. Like the supraspinatus, it's innervated by the suprascapular nerve and gets its blood supply from the suprascapular artery. Notice here, the suprascapular artery passes over the suprascapular ligament and the suprascapular nerve passes under the ligament through the suprascapular notch. The mnemonic to remember this is the Army passes over the bridge, and the Navy passes under the bridge. The teres minor, which sits right next to the infraspinatus in the axillary or armpit region, is the third of the fourth rotator cuff muscles. It attaches to the scapula in the humerus. Specifically, it originates from the lateral or axillary border of the scapula, and reaches behind the humerus to insert onto the lower part of the greater tubercle, just below the attachment of the infraspinatus. The teres minor will act as a synergist to the infraspinatus by helping it to externally rotate the arm at the shoulder. It also helps to slow a speeding arm. Since it's lower than the infraspinatus and thus under the pivot point of the humeral head in the glenoid cavity, the teres minor will also adduct or adduct the arm at the shoulder. It'll also function to stabilize the shoulder by helping to set the head of the humerus into the glenoid cavity. It's innervated by the axillary nerve, which is the same innervation as what muscle? That's right, the deltoid. The blood supply to the teres minor comes from the suprascapular artery and the circumflex scapular artery. The fourth muscle of the rotator cuff is the subscapularis muscle. It's located between the scapula and the rib cage and is accessible through the armpit region if it needs to be directly treated. Like the other rotator cuff muscles, it also attaches to both the scapula and the humerus. Specifically, it originates from the subscapular fossa and runs anteriorly to insert onto the lesser tubercle of the humerus, the only one of the four rotator cuff muscles that does not attach to the greater tubercle. When the subscapularis contracts, it acts to internally rotate the arm at the shoulder. It's one of the muscles responsible for rotating the arm forward during the throwing motion. Other muscles will help to internally rotate during the throwing motion, like the pectoralis major, anterior deltoid, and latissimus dorsi. And since it's a rotator cuff muscle, it'll also function to stabilize the shoulder by helping to set the head of the humerus into the glenoid cavity. It's innervated by the upper and lower subscapular nerves. It receives its blood supply from the circumflex scapular artery and some from the dorsal scapular and suprascapular arteries. You can train each rotator cuff muscle individually by doing exercises for the supraspinatus, exercises for the infraspinatus, exercises for the teres minor, and exercises for the subscapularis. But this takes a lot of time, doing multiple reps and sets for each muscle. I like to look for more efficient ways to get things done. And one of the things I've found is that you can use a partially deflated ball to train your rotator cuff muscles. It could be any kind of ball. A playground ball, a soccer ball, a basketball, a volleyball, or even a physio ball. Just take the ball, put it up against the wall, and press your fist into it. Next, 
move your fist up and down, and then back and forth. If you want to increase the range of motion for this exercise, you can use a bigger ball. You can increase the resistance by pressing your fist harder into the ball. Try it for yourself. See how fast your shoulders get tired. This exercise will train all your rotator cuff muscles at once. This still takes some time to do, however, time away from performing other exercises in your workout. The next level of efficiency I found when it comes to training rotator cuff muscles is to train them while you perform your workout exercises. The best way to do this, in my opinion, is to train with bands. When I add bands to my exercises like push-ups or bench press, it's kind of like doing the fist in the ball exercise at the same time. It increases my strength and stability so much that when I bench without bands, I feel so much stronger and stable and more confident under the weight. And nowadays, more and more strength coaches are using bands with their athletes. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider clicking like and subscribing to my channel. Don't forget to turn on notifications to get alerted to all my latest videos. For more helpful anatomy and physiology study resources, visit www.humanbodyhelp.com.